whatever it is that you think is interesting and you enjoy talking about and you resonates with you, talk about it. If you're consistently giving and sharing insights that are helpful to your audience on the things that are keeping them up at night, mm. that is what changes the game. I think people need to fundamentally sit down and do the homework, read a fucking book, listen to a podcast, like whatever it is, go to Bali for a month and sit under a tree and meditate. Whatever it is that you need to do, but understand what you want from your life because otherwise life passes you by. So what I wanted to start with, Amelia, is a bit of a potted history on you because mm -hmm. I know a lot about what you're doing today and I've read bits about your career and where you, you know, where you've come from and what your career looked like. You've launched previous businesses. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know a little bit more about your story and what got you to launching your own agency. My story, God, where do you want to start? Um, I think I've always been a entrepreneur. And I, th I think it's important to state the distinction of what I think the difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner is. What I mean by I've always been an entrepreneur is I've always had some kind of side hustle, some kind of business, some kind of venture going on somewhere. So whether that was when I was like 12 years old, I'd go into salvo shops and buy like Levi jeans or like designer things that the little granny behind the till didn't know was designer. I'd clean them up and then I'd resell them on eBay for like five times what I paid for them. Or when I was at university, I had a little cupcake stand that I used to sell stuff. So I've always had something going on. Um, and it's always been like an itch that I felt like I needed to scratch. And so when I left university, which ironically I did public relations and, commun and applied communications, um, and during my university time did uh, internships in the summers and I work like I look back now at like the work ethic I had back then I'm like holy shit like I was just like a machine because I was at university full time I worked in a nightclub Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday nights I worked in a clothes shop every Sunday daytime and I did internships in the summer so like I didn't the only day I had, only had time I had off was Saturday day like that was the only day I had off um and during my summers, I'd be doing these internships. So I interned with like Marks and Spencer's, um, Food, Wine and Flowers, Press Department, Myla Lingerie, Hellgate PR, which is like a pretty big lifestyle agency. And I got to the end of my degree and I was like, I don't want to sell myself to the devil. Like to be good at PR, you literally have to be on 24 seven. And I just didn't want to do that. And obviously when I left university, it was 2012, um, 2012, yeah, 2012. And the crash was just kind of coming out of it, but there were still no jobs. Like no one was hiring students or graduates. No one had any like low level jobs really going because no one wanted to take the risk on new um, people. So all the people that I was graduating with were going and working in like Starbucks or like whatever, because they just couldn't get a graduate job. But I was like, fuck this, I'm determined. Like I'm not gonna go and work in a shop for the rest of my life. Um, and so I probably sent out about 250 applications um, just to anything, like like anything that I thought I'd be good at. So marketing executive roles, PR roles, um, event sales roles. And eventually I landed this sales role in an events company. And that was kind of like what kickstarted, I guess, my career because it was a, what I would describe as a inherently toxic sales environment of like, I don't, I don't want to speak ill of my boss, but she was like crazy. <laughs> So she was like micromanager, breathing down your neck, like really off the handle all the time. And so that experience as a graduate was like quite humbling because you kind of get sold this dream of like what the workplace is going to be like. And it's going to be all great. And like, it's going to be so fun. You get to make a change. But actually the reality is when you're a graduate, you have to eat a lot of shit. And I ate a lot of shit in that first role. But I also made good money. And I learned I was really good at sales. And that built my confidence. And it was actually the building of the confidence in that 12 month period that then kickstarted my desire to start my own business because I was like well if I can sell this product that's very difficult to sell to NatWest and K like KPMG and Capgemini I can run my own thing no problem and so I started I left that first role only having one year in industry experience and was like screw you I don't want to work for anyone I want to work for myself and I started as all 21 year old women probably want to do start my own fashion brand and actually in year one it was really good like we got funding um you know did the whole pitch deck thing um stocked in 15 boutiques internationally. So I had two arms of the business. One was the B2B side where we manufactured clothes of the brand and we sold it into retail. And then the other side of the business was our e-commerce side where we sold stuff through our website. And so it was really profitable. We were doing really well enough to pay myself a wage and like all that kind of stuff. And then I got cocky because I was like, oh, I've got this covered, you know, year one smashing it. Obviously I know what I'm doing. Um, and then I lost everything year two because I had so much hubris and so so much lack of understanding of what it took really to run a business. But most importantly, I didn't really love that business. I just loved being self-employed. 
And as a result, it failed. And to kind of summarize how I've got to where I am now, I went back into work for 10 years because I didn't have, I was so wounded by, I think a lot of people don't understand unless you are, unless I say this and you go, oh my God, that's me. You don't understand the identity crisis that you have when you're no longer in charge of your own, your own business or you lose your business. It's like being married and all of a sudden getting divorced or um, being a mum and all of a sudden your children move out. Like there was such an identity crisis that happened when that business fell because I wasn't Amelia. I was Amelia, the fa- like the 21 year old founder of this business. And, you know, I'd kind of been in the Daily Mail as that and like been online as that. And like all my friends were like, oh, my God, you're running your own business. And so when that business failed, there was so much shame. It was like mm-hmm. someone had died almost, like a part of me had died. And I felt so much shame and I lost all that confidence that I built up in running that business. And so going back into the world of work was really scary, but I'm so glad that I did it because it gave me an opportunity to learn all the things that I hadn't had the opportunity to learn prior because I'd only had a year of industry experience and work under people who were far better than me, far more experienced than me, had been running their own businesses, were C-level, um, and I was very, very lucky that the companies I consequently joined and were headhunted into and the bosses I had just by sheer luck, I guess, um, were very encouraging of my attitude of like, I don't want to fucking work for anyone. And like, they didn't mind that I was kind of unemployable, but they knew I was talented. So they sort of just like, let me get on with it. Um, and I don't think if I'd had those employers, I would be sitting here today because I wouldn't have been able to learn what I've learned to make launch and build clout into a profitable, you know, growing, thriving business. So, yeah, a lot. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing story. Do you know what, so, so much of that resonates with me because my first job also was in sales. So I joined, You were, I don't even know if you'll know this, but you know, Auto Trader, there was yeah. another one called Exchange and Mart. Yeah. I'm a bit older than you. Um, and that was my kind of first foray into working. And it was like two weeks of hardcore yeah. sales training. And you know what, I think there's such a huge... I mean, I get to speak to some amazing people on this podcast with loads of, you know, and and I truly, truly stand by the fact that real innovation comes from having a diverse group of people Mm. within your business, within Mm. your agency, whatever kind of business business is that you're running. However, the really successful business leaders that I speak to have all grown up in some kind of sales role. And I think having that kind of first foray in and being able to and understanding how important sales and marketing is because it is the foundation of everything to me for my business Mm. you know when I speak to other agency owners that maybe you know have a creative past or a tech past they just don't have that drive that hunger or place that importance Mm. on the sales and marketing side of the business so I do I really massively think as well as obviously the experiences that you went on to have that understanding the importance of driving those sales and having that hunger for growth is super, super important. Oh my God, a hundred percent. Like I, I always, I actually say this to the team and actually when we're hiring people now, I've just hired someone um, to join the team in the sales department and they've come from a recruitment background. And part of that was because I came from a recruitment ba- background. And for those, I think recruitment is a little bit different now, but it's still pretty hardcore. Like when I was in recruitment, like it was the first job. So basically when my, when my <laughs> business failed, I went online and I typed in, what jobs can you do that make you the most money that you don't need any experience to do? And the number one thing was recruitment. So I was like, well, I'll just do that. So I went into recruitment and it was fucking brutal. Like hundred calls a day. You had to be in at 8.30. You never left before seven. Um, you took 30 minutes if you were lucky for lunch. Like it was just relentless. And you were just smile and dial, smile and dial, smile, smashing phones mm. all day. And at the time there were days when I was like, oh my God, this is hell. Like why the hell am I doing this to myself? But it was the kind of brutality and the sort of bullpen of it that gives you the resilience and the drive and the discipline, I guess, just keep going because you get paid a decent amount of money. Like I was billing like 30 grand a month, um, which for a rookie recruiter was pretty good um, and, and making a good amount of money. And I think the important thing of the sales piece, which most people that fail in business are because as you said, they fundamentally don't understand the importance of sales. Everything is sales. Like I think everyone should do a stint in sales at some point in their life because you have to understand sales is everything. Sales is your job interview. Sales is your, you know, trying to persuade someone to go on a date with you. Sales is trying to convince your child to have their fucking broccoli with their dinner. Like everything is sales. So if you don't understand sales, how the fuck do you expect to succeed in life, let let alone business? Like you need revenue to live. You need to be able to persuade people to communicate effectively. So if you don't understand sales, 
what are you doing? Yeah. Go we, and learn how to do it. <laughs> yeah, you literally can't. I'm so, you, you've you literally echoed everything that I say there because if you can't, like you say, you can't exist in life. No. You can't, it's so, so hard. You're, every time you're talking to anyone, you're selling yourself, you're selling yeah. your position, you're selling your, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, like you say, even on going on a date. Everything is sales. Everything it's is sales. It's not a dirty word. I think people think sales is like slick, you know, car, used car salesman. It's not. Everything is sales. When you post something online, you're selling yourself. When you're having a conversation with the barista and you're smiling at them, you're selling yourself. But you're also not selling yourself too, right? So you have to think about every every interaction is sales or not selling. Like, but that's the way that people should be looking at yeah. looking at it. Well, you're leading me really easily along to the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is why you started Clout. So. I know that you launched the agency amidst the pandemic. Yes. Um, because not long after I launched my agency. And where, did, like, where, what got you to the point of wanting to launch Clout? And what was important to you about launching a branding agency? Yeah, it's interesting because when I first, so I wanted to launch the business because I've always had, as I said, like at the beginning, I've always had an itch that needed to be scratched. And I've always wanted to work for myself. And even since that business failed, and initially when I was 22, 23, I knew that I was gonna work for myself, but I didn't know what that thing was yet. And very naturally I fell into personal branding and I didn't even know it was called that at the time because I worked out, to go back to our point about sales, I worked out in recruitment that the quickest way for me to generate business was to, to market myself to the clients and to the candidates, but more importantly the clients because they're the ones paying me. Um, and so I kind of went on this sort of marketing journey and PR journey, if you like, of applying all the skills that I'd learned in marketing my own business, but for myself to these CEOs um, and found it to be quite fruitful. And so I continued doing that and did so well with that. The company I was working for was recruited and rehired me as the B2B marketing manager and so on and so forth. And because of the sort of application of putting content out there and kind of distributing my thoughts and opinions on marketing, I naturally attracted an audience. And so I went from like 1500 followers to 18,000 pretty quickly. Um, and as a result was headhunted to go and work for a, a recruitment private equity company. And during the pandemic, I think like many people, and look, I know a lot of people had a pretty tough time and people lost loved ones and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to diminish someone else's experience because my experience was different. However, the pandemic was the best thing that ever happened to me because it put a mirror up to my life like there was no way to escape. I was sitting in the four walls of my house with a husband I did, definitely didn't enjoy living with and two children who were just feral because they could like we couldn't go anywhere, right? And I was looking at myself in the mirror like metaphorically and thinking, is this gonna be my life? Like, am I literally gonna be working for 50 grand a year for a company like I like, but like not really that asked about with that husband, not really asked about, is this my life? Um, and I had, it was probably literally between like lockdown and like may i was like no i don't want this this is not this is not what i want for me and i've i kind of went on this sort of self development journey from that moment of like i've always liked books and i've always liked podcasts but i went hard like i was reading like a book a week listening to podcasts every single morning meditating every morning i started running i don't run anymore but i started running and i take exercise same, very seriously by the way. yeah same time, yeah same. um but i take it very seriously it's now part of my like weekly daily routine um, and I just changed my entire life. And I think because I changed my entire life, I needed to change my environment that I was living in. And so part of that was separating from my ex-husband or soon to be ex-husband. And the other part of that was from separating from the career that I'd spent 10 years building. So I was like, I don't want to do this. This is not what I want to do. Um, but I want to do what I'm doing for a living, but just not for someone else. Mm. I want to do it for myself. Um, and I guess to answer your question about like launching Clout, it, I launched it in August 2020 so like the year of the, of the pandemic and I think we were actually just out of lockdown two mm. and we were about to go into lockdown yeah. three in September it's fucking chaos um but <laughs> crazy times I'm convinced that they're going to teach that at school when our kids are like a little bit older and they're going to be like mommy what was it really or grandma or grandma what was it really like in your school yeah. like, I can't even remember I was just drunk all the time yeah. <laughs> um but um I just thought if I can launch and I didn't have any big grand plans of have, building this huge agency I just thought you know if I can earn the same amount that I'm earning right now but do it for myself, I'm gonna be so much happier. So that was my goal. My goal was like earn the same amount, 40, 50,000 pounds a year, 60,000 pounds a year of what I'm earning right now and then and then see how I go. And because I'd already built up this community of people, when I announced that I was launching the business, 
I got two clients within the first three days and that paid my salary. <laughs> but, yeah. So I was like, oh, Done. okay. Yeah. Um, and to, to go back to our point of sales, like people don't understand that you're selling to people in every single interaction you have. So the two years that I'd spent building value and communicating to people and giving them free advice and, and building relationships with people in the DMs and the comments and accumulating this followership of I think like 20 something thousand when I launched Cloud meant that when I did launch the business, people were like, oh my God, yeah, how can I pay you to work with me? There was no convincing needed. Mm. They were already convinced. They were just like, here's my credit card, like, let's go. Um, and I think there is something in that for people who are listening to this, who are maybe launching a business or doing a campaign for a client or anything like that. Think about what you can give to people before you ask for anything in return, because it's the number of times you give before you ask for anything in return is basically determines how valuable you are to anyone, whether that be to a date, like, you know, like, or, or someone pursuing you, like pursue someone long enough and eventually they'll say yes. Or, and it's the same with, with sales, like give, 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 and then ask. Yeah. And that's kind of what I did with my community. And it never feels like you're selling then. And I think that- I've I would, never sold clout ever. Yeah, I, likewise. Not, not inherently, well, I do, but like, you yeah. know what I mean. But you don't need to because, I mean, this is, I guess what my agency is also grounded in is if you continually push out helpful, insightful content in whatever form, I guess is, you know, is, and there's lots of different ways to do that, but in whatever form is, I guess more human, the better, but yeah. in whatever form that is, whether that's written content, whether that's video content, whether that's a podcast, whether that's a you know, in-person event, whatever it might be, if you're consistently giving and sharing insights that are helpful to your audience on the things that are keeping them up at night, mm. that is what get, changes the game. You will never, I mean, I literally talk about this all the time. We have never had to make a cold call at Street because every single client comes to us and even if we I mean we use some pretty clever marketing automation technologies as well so if we did need to do outbounding it would only ever be warm outbounding because mm. we can see the mm. engaged prospects that we have that I are think all outbound should be warm though yeah it should never it have should never predictable be told. revenue no that's such a good book so oh, I, I've I like got like this. five people onto it at the minute it's self-published and it's a bit you know, like rudimental but like it's amazing and it's it's by the guy Aaron Ross who was basically one of the founding inside sales teams members at Salesforce and so when he joined Salesforce there was like 100 people in the company it was a big company but it wasn't the company like only people in Silicon Valley knew who Salesforce were everyone yeah no one else who knew what they were and he basically built up the inside sales team on this model of cold calling 2.0 so it's not cold calling it's warm prospecting yeah where you send people emails and you you research the company you give them value before you speak to them so you don't even speak to them you do yeah. everything before that Perfect. and I'm, I've, I've just finished reading that and it's interesting because it it, it confirmed a lot of my thought processes around sales in that everything should be warm, everyone should know who you are, yada, yada, yada. But it's also made me think more aggressively about, I know you said like, you know, you don't have to do cold calling. Well, I'm going hard now on the outbound stuff. Like we just hired this salesperson to do that kind of expressly for us because I think there is a place for that. I think people love to hate outbound sales and like, oh, and I've always operated on like, we're 100% inbound, aren't we lovely? But actually like the growth that I want the business to have is more important than my ability to be able to say we're 100% inbound. And yes, it's great. We can get 100% inbound and we're going to do 2 million pounds in revenue this year on inbound. But wouldn't it be great if we could do 5 million or 4 million and add outbound prospecting to that mix, but in a really human yes. and authentic way and it not just be like, hi, do you want personal branding services? Of course yeah. you fucking don't. No, but that, and that's, I mean, that's what we do. So hopefully I can, I can tell you a bit about this, but you know, essentially, you know, I'm so with you on that. We had a fantastic lady working for us last year. Sadly, she's gone on to work for Pearlfish now, but amazing for her career. Um, and she basically did that. She, but all of our prospects were warm because they have been engaging with our mm -hmm. content. We use HubSpot. We're, in a, we're able to see what content they've engaged with, you know, which podcast they've clicked through to listen on, you know, which events of ours they've attended, whether that be a webinar mm. or an in-person event. So we can we can see that they're engaged. We can see that they trust us. And that's what you know, our inbound strategy works really, really well because people come to us, they already trust and know me. Mm. They already trust and know our content. They are already engaged with us. They already understand how we can help them. If you can then 
use that data using something like HubSpot. There's some great platforms out there. I can tell you about a lot of them. Um, but you know, HubSpot will use another really great, much smaller um, software called Kudia. So they call themselves software and a service, and mm. they're brilliant. Um, but that gives us all the data that we need to mean that we're only ever speaking to the people that are most likely mm. to buy us. Because qualified. They're, they're qualified. They're truly qualified. Yeah, they've highly engaged with our content, and therefore it's going to be so much easier to sell to them. Mm. So if you can turn people on to do that, and we did really, we, you know, we'd run campaigns. We did some you know, great campaigns around things like you know, Valentine's Day. I always kind of congratulated Nicole for this. I'm going to have to tag her in this content because she is awesome. She did a, uh, at, this, at this point, we were mainly working with marketing agencies and she did an email campaign that was like, I've broken up with my partner was the title. And then in the, in the rest of the email was like my my agency partner are you looking for a new agency to help you you know yeah. drive more engagement get more leads blah, blah, blah. and she literally booked like 25 phone calls yeah, or something yeah. off the back of this one email because it's human within That's hours it's human it's interesting and that is i think what's so important in any marketing strategy and what i absolutely love about your content is that you're bringing people to life i think certainly in the b2b space so many people think they have to show up like a business mm. that they have to be really corporate in their content and their language and design these beautiful marketing newsletters. I'm no not reads. saying you, you, you don't, you know, that's not part of it, but actually the human side of things for me is where we just get the real results. All of our emails come from a person. Mm. It looks like, I mean, although they are actually going to thousands of people and actually coming from a marketing automation platform, they look like they're from a person. People think that it's someone emailing them. No one wants to be emailed by a marketing team. A hundred percent. And I think that's a big thing that people miss is like, I want to go just touch back on what you said about adding insights and value and all that kind of stuff through your content. P P I think people don't fundamentally understand what that means. Like they go, oh, because we have to write this big white paper or we have to do this huge blog on like all these tips and stuff. I'm like, actually to be valuable can be as simple as an, an email going out from the CEO on a Friday being like, this, yeah. is what this is what's happened in the industry this week that you should know about for your business. Or like, here are some things that I think, here are my thoughts for this week. Like the diary of the CEO, Stephen Bartlett started you know, with that simple concept. Like it was, it was about getting people engaged with him, therefore they would buy from social chain, right? Um, and I think people need to understand what valuable does it need to be here's a huge chunk of information that you may or may not read. It could be a meme. It could be like part of the newsletter that we do every single month is month, week, month, week, can't remember. Danielle's going to kill me for not remembering because my amazing marketing person do, um, deals all that kind of stuff now. But she does these incredible newsletters and they're like rundowns of like who's killing it, per their personal brand right now, what you can learn from here are some lessons. Oh, here's a meme on like some LinkedIn thing that everyone can relate to because everyone's on LinkedIn. And stuff. So it's like, how can you humanize your brand? And just because you're B2B, there is someone behind that business with, who is making a buying decision. And unless you're appealing to their pain points, their lifestyle goals, their um, dreams and, and um, whatever, and selling them painkillers and selling them the lifestyle and selling them the dream that they want, why would they buy from you? Like, let's not forget about 60 to 70% of buying decisions made from emotion. So why wouldn't you want to try and trigger that emotion in someone? Like, it's it's just obvious to me. Yeah, everyone is so worried. And, I, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't try and differentiate yourself, but about differentiating themselves. At yeah. the end of the day, there's going to be lots of other branding agencies. Yeah. There's going to be lots of other Which is a good thing. Agencies. It means it's a proven concept. Yeah, right? exactly. Com there's a reason why Burger King buys up fucking slots next to McDonald's, right? Yeah. They like the differentiation because everyone goes, I'm team... Burger King, no, I'm Team McDonald's or I'm Coke, I'm Pepsi. Like, that's a good thing. Yeah. You want people to be like, I'm that person or I'm Android, I'm iPhone. You want that. That's yeah. good. And I think, but that's where the human, like, people are like, why would they come to our event or why would they listen to my podcast above someone else's? Because it's you. Yeah. And you need, you're, you know, even if you're not totally different, you're going to have humans and people within your business that are going to talk about your business in an authentic mm -hmm. way that some people are going to connect with and some people aren't going to connect with. And if they don't, they were never going to be my client, client anyway. Yeah, yeah, they were never going to work well with me. They were never going to get on with my team. And we've made that, you know, we have made that mistake. I fought to win business because I didn't want my competitors to have it, you know, because at the, at one point we were quite, a, you know, in quite a small niche and marketing agency for marketing agencies. There's probably 10 well-known yeah. players within that space. And that's all we did. And I didn't want my competitors to win it over me because I didn't want them to have more market share than yeah. I did. But now I know actually me, you know, doing things like this podcast, talking about what I believe in and who I am and how we work 
enables me to qualify in the right kind of clients mm. as well and not actually work with the shitheads that were never going to be a good match for me or the team and actually often would do us more damage than good. I think we put so much fucking emphasis on hiring for value fit, right, mm. with candidates. Everyone talks about it. any leadership or or um, on like any podcast you listen to, any content you listen to around that topic. The the founder or the CEO will go, make sure you hire people for your values. Like how do, how do you interview people to hire people for your values? Because they need to fit in your culture. But who the fuck does that for their clients? So like we have a vetting system here. We if you if you don't meet the particular values that we hold as a business, we won't work with you. Yeah. We have a three month trial period at the beginning of our contract. So if we decide at the end of the three month trial period you're not for us, we won't continue to work with you. Love that. And that is a non-negotiable for us because I don't want to work. I don't want to put such an emphasis on my team fitting our values and be like, oh, by the way, you need to work with this asshole because like we need the money. No, fuck the money. Mm. Fuck the money because the right money will come to you if you're hard and fast on what you believe in. And I think part of the reason why people like working with us and our our clients have stayed loyal to us is because we are hard and fast on those values and they match our values too. So even when there is ups and downs, naturally as there is, anyone listening to this who works on an agency knows that things go wrong all the time, often not in your control, but they do. Um, it means that you have that relationship with them and you have that mutual understanding so that things can be fixed. It's not just, it's very difficult to break a relationship, right? And I think it's very hard to build a relationship if you don't have shared values, but it's very easy to break a contract. Yeah. So. The same values as, are so important. Do you know what? It goes back to something we were talking about earlier. Um, it's the same as marriage, right? I, can't, I often relate the kind of you know, agency client relationship or any kind of business relationship, I guess, to the dating world yeah. because it is, you're kind of going through that process. Like, you know, I don't know, you start flicking on Tinder, that might be like equivalent to you looking on Google yeah, or where, yeah. however you're, find, you're looking on LinkedIn and Which one looks looking nice, at content. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Who do I, who do I want to work with? Then you're moving forward. You know, you're kind of, I don't know, starting to date them. You're, that's maybe you know, going through the early processes of starting to work together through to signing a contract, getting married. And there's gonna, you've got to have some kind of, or maybe it's more of the engagement and then cutting that point at the point where, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it doesn't, and it doesn't always work. You know, yeah. sadly, having run a business, you know, or my own business now for four years, um, I know not every, and I can spot it really, really early. Mm. I'm much better at, qualifying in and call and it's and I can tell you now it's mainly about the people and the yeah. attitude of those people if they don't sit right with us or if I don't feel they sit right I just won't even yeah. as much as I want the money I yeah, just won't yeah. work with them anymore because I know the damage can be so much you know I get, the damage can be so much bigger than the value of that money to the, the best thing you can do as a business owner is fight clients that don't fit your values yeah and that's a hard pill to swallow at the time like I did that last year I fired four clients in a row and that's a lot of money for us. Mm. There was like 20 grand in monthly recurring revenue. Yeah, scary. Huge, like yeah. wild, um, like quarter of a million pounds a year or more. Um, and at the time I was like, is this the right decision? Did I make the right choice? And actually, of course I did. Of course it was the right decision because my team was were happier because I backed them up on clients who were being an asshole and told them to fuck off. Um, but also our overarching client base were happier because we were so much more invested in those clients that we enjoyed working with. They got better results because we weren't getting time sapped to people who were just not really aligned with what we wanted to be doing for them. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important lesson that I had to learn the hard way, but I think that everyone should learn, which is like just fire people and also clients that don't meet you at the level that you want to be at. Yeah, scary to do, but honestly, we'll I mean, we've done exactly the same. It just, it's helped us grow. And I really know, you know who our future client is now and who I want to work with and the ones that will make us more money. You know, it cut, it cut you're know, growing a business, growing any kind of business, it's all, you're always gonna learn as you kind of go through these mm -hmm. things. I think it's like, like life, like you were saying earlier, you know, some of the things that have hurt me the most have been the things that have yeah. helped me grow the most as a person and also, you know, be brave enough to run my own business. Now, I cannot leave today's podcast without asking you about personal branding in a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. So there'll be loads of people listening that literally do not know where to get started, don't know you know, what their values are, don't understand yet, you know, what maybe their business idea is. Maybe they don't, um, 
they don't really know how they can get themselves you know to a point where they're starting to work mm. on their personal brand so someone that's starting out what advice do you or would you give them in order to start to focus on and the steps they should take to start building their personal brand yeah i think one of the biggest misconceptions um which are peddled by people like me um, around personal branding is that you need to have a strategy to start. Mm. Um, and actually, I don't think that's true. I, I haven't met a single successful business owner or successful marketing person who was like, yeah, we had this really detailed strategy and really detailed business plan before we built the business. No, you fucking didn't. You just went, actually, that looks like that might work. Let's fucking try it. And then you get the data in order to then make the strategic decisions, right? So I think if you're at that point where you're like, I want to be building my personal brand, I know I should be doing it, but I don't know what the fuck I want to be known for or what are my values blah 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 just start posting stuff spend six weeks posting whatever the frick it is that you want to post do you want to comment on politics do that do you want to comment on katie price do that do you want to you know talk about your experience as a football referee on sunday league do that like whatever it is that you think is interesting and you enjoy talking about and you resonates with you talk about it talk about it because what will happen is over the six weeks if you post every day, you will accumulate data which will indicate to you, A, what your audience likes to hear about. So there's examples I just gave there. You might actually realize that the things that people really enjoyed talking or listening to you talk about was football. Okay, that's interesting. Why do people like listening to me football? Oh, most of my content was about me analyzing what was happening in the football over the weekend. Mm. That's interesting. So how can I apply that to my personal? And then you can go on a journey with it. But the second thing is it will help you identify what you enjoy talking about. So that's the most important thing, because if you've accumulated like somewhat of an audience, whether it's just friends or family to this point, they might not necessarily enjoy the things that you enjoy talking about. So although what your audience responds to is an important thing, it's not as important as what is it that you enjoy talking about. And that's how I got into personal branding. I enjoyed talking about books I was reading, like the self-development things I was doing, the experiments I was doing with the market, with HubSpot, like, you know, what my open rates were, what email signatures, um, what email subject lines were working best for me and like what the click-through rates were on specific things that I put. And this was all the information that I was finding interesting in my day-to-day -day life, work, play, you know, professional, personal. And it was then in turn, because I was doing more of that stuff because I enjoyed it, I attracted more people that enjoyed that type of content. And so my my audience built up of people that liked that type of content. The biggest mistake you can do is, I always use this analogy of, say you want to be a vegan chef. And so far on Instagram and TikTok, you've only ever posted pictures of you in a bikini and like looking gorgeous and whatever. And of course you get engagement for that because it's telling you like the algorithm's going, this is really good, give us more of this. And then when you start posting your vegan meals and your vegan meal prep and your recipes, you get no likes. And people go, oh my God, but I can't do that because everyone's liking my bikini pics, so I need to go back to posting that. That's because you've accumulated an audience of people that like the bikini pics. So you need to kind of eat the shit. If you want to, if you want to build a personal brand around a specific thing, you have to eat the shit at the beginning and realize that actually you might not have an audience of people that like the thing that you like, but it's most important that you understand what you want to be known for and the stuff that you enjoy talking about. So I think that's the most important place to start. Once you've done that little experiment of the six weeks, you know, a couple of months of like posting stuff and seeing what sticks, you can then start thinking about a strategy. And where we started with, the, with our clients and the agency with the strategy is always what is their personal North Star? And like, you might think, what the fuck does that mean? Okay, let me simplify it. Where do you wanna be in five years? What do you want? I mean, literally everything. What do you want? Do you wanna exit your business? Do you wanna be an MP? Do you wanna have children? Do you wanna be married? Do you wanna like, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah, you. What, is, what do you want? Not yeah. your business, not your partner. Not your, what do you want in five years? And that's quite a confronting question, right? What the fuck do any of us want in five years? We don't freaking know because we're so head down trying to get to the end of the year. Well, Amelia, what do you want in five years? Do I can't know? really talk about it. Yeah, I do, but I can't really talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm very clear on what I want. Okay, good. There, there is going to be an event that's going to happen year seven, so in five years time from now, an event that's going to happen with clout. It's going to be somewhere between a PE deal and like a, a, a percentage acquisition. Or nice. I'm going to acquire the business, but something's going to happen. And everything I do is geared towards that goal. Everything. So for example, I can get calls often from radios, TV, blah, 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 wanting me to comment on specific things from a brand perspective. To me, does it align to that? Nope, sorry, not doing it. I don't give a shit how big the the platform is or how big the whatever. If it doesn't align to where I want to be, I don't do it. 
But if it does lie in trying to be, I do it. So having that North Star is really important because I think it gives you a ring fence as to what you do and do not want to talk about. And also it helps you reverse engineer a strategy. So if I know that hypothetically at year seven, I want to say like, take a bit of money off the table. Let's say hypothetically, that's what my goal is. It's not, but that, that's say hypothetically, that's my goal. I want to sell 30% of my business year seven. That means by year seven, my business needs to be as profitable as humanly possible in order for me to take an amount of money that seems worthwhile off the table at year seven. Okay, so that's my goal. So who do I need to be attracting then in order to make that happen? Okay, well, I need to be attracting customers, right? So who is my ideal customer right now? Well, it's this person who's a CEO of that type of business. We really like working with marketing agencies. So maybe we want to target founders of, of marketing agencies between sort of 100, 250 employees, yada, yada. Great, so that's my audience. What can I be talking about to make those audience feel heard? Great, well, they're all founders. So first of all, I want to be talking about business, right? Because that's going to resonate with them. The second thing I want to be talking about is maybe hiring and employees and, and scaling and all that kind of stuff because that's also going to be resonating with them. But I also want to be talking about personal branding because these people don't know they need a personal brand yet. So I'm going to attract them in with the entrepreneurship and the business stuff and the scaling bit because that's what resonates with them and I'm going to punch them in the face with the personal branding mm -hmm. stuff because they're going to go, holy shit, that chick's got 150,000 followers and she's got 100% inbound business and we want that. How has she done that? Oh, she's done it through personal branding. Let me give her a call. And that then feeds back to my goal of revenue, profit, clients, in order to exit for that 30% percent i want to take off the table. So understanding what your goal is, is the number one thing because yeah. everything comes back to that. And it's got to be your personal goal. Do you know, I, yeah. I have always had really clear goals about my business, my growth plans, where I want to go. And tie numbers to do. it too, if you yeah. need to. Definitely. You know, we've got it. a three-year plan, five-year plan. Uh, but what I didn't do, which you spoke about as well, um, and I won't be as mean to ask you about that, but I didn't think about what do I want personally. And when I got an non-executive on board who's done really well, you know, he, sold, he sold his agency twice. First of all, um, you know, he sold Nice Agency to Kamarama, then he sold Kamarama to Accenture. He's been absolutely brilliant to me. And he was like, when we had our first call, I always remember him saying to me, but Katie, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Like, i.e., like, like the life stuff. Like, do you want to go and live in Bali? Like, what? Yeah, what, yeah. what? What's your goal? Because that's... that would dictate what the business needs exactly. to do. Exactly. The first thing someone ever said to me, uh, like a mentor, like in, in that kind of capacity, when I first launched Count, was, "What do you want to earn?" Yes. And I was like, "Oh, I don't know." And they're like, "Well, then, how the fuck do you know what you <laughs> want to target for?" And I was like, well, why does it matter what I want to earn? They were like, because you, as the director of the business, can only earn money if the business is profitable. Yeah. So what do you want to earn? And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So then that got me really thinking about like, because I went into business, I was always that kid that was like, oh, maths isn't my thing. Maths is now my thing. Like I live in spreadsheets oh, now. Oh, God, yeah. I know my profit margin on a day to fucking day basis, right? I know my overheads. I know what my cost of sale is. I know everything. Cash everything. flow, yeah. Cash flow, everything. Yeah. I know how much money I've got on the bank right this minute, right? But that's only because it's tied to what I want from my life. So I think people need to fundamentally sit down and do the homework, read a fucking book, listen to a podcast, like whatever it is, go to Bali for a month and sit under a tree and meditate. Whatever it is that you need to do, but understand what you want from your life because otherwise life passes you by and you don't achieve anything. Yeah. You just chug along and da, da, da. And that moment for me was in the lockdown when I was like, no, it's not what I want. I want to be on a yacht. I want to be able, this sounds ridiculous, right? And I always use the now the, the team will laugh at me because I always say I haven't had this pink Lamborghini. This pink, I always want to buy this pink Urus love that that's my thing but it's not that i want the obnoxious pink urus as much as i would love that because i think it'd be hilarious it's what it represents it represents the money that i want to earn from having worked my ass off for a decade to get a business to a, to the certain point right but equally that also represents what i've managed to do for my team because if i can buy that urus that means like half of my team will be in senior management by that point and they will be earning you know 150,000 pounds a year and be able to do whatever the fuck they want to do and maybe mm. someone wants to start their own businesses and I can help them start that. So it's what it, it's not about me driving a pink fucking Lamborghini, which everyone thinks is like this stupid, obnoxious dream. It's about what that represents. It about It's about for me to be able to afford to have a 300,000 pound car, I need to have like at least 20 million in the bank. So what could I do with that 20 million to change the world? And that I think visualizing what your goals are is really helpful to making sure that you stay on track with those. Because then it's not just a, oh, by year seven, I want to do this. It's like, no, I want to have this house. I want to live in this house. I want to have that car. I want my kids to do, go to this school. I want to go and live in Bali for a half, the, like whatever it is. Be obnoxious about it because it's that obnoxious, outrageous goal that will actually get you there. 
Yeah. So like I think Gary Vee says all the time he wants to buy the New York Jets. He doesn't actually want to buy the New York Jets, but it's that dream that keeps him striving for growth. Yeah. Do you know what also, and I think you, I'm sure you probably get lots of amazing messages like this as well, is if you have those goals and those dreams, how you can inspire other people. And yeah. you know, as much as it's great, you know, there's some fantastic celebrities out there and you know, that let's be honest, don't really do that much, but just look pretty and you know, sit on TV doing whatever they do. But actually what you're doing, and I love getting these emails, is from you know, inspiring other younger women to go and launch their own business, to be brave enough to put themselves out there and to actually take action. Because I think that's so many people, in fact, I'm talking on a panel discussion at MadFest um, about just female founders. That, yeah. Have you? Yeah. Oh, no way. We're maybe going to be on the same yeah, panel then. Maybe. Um, so, and it, there's some kind of scary stat, like only 5% of... Um, founders i think globally are women yeah it, which is absolutely insane so for me now also as well as obviously having my own financial goals and my own vision what i absolutely love and i've and i've come to learn this from getting the lovely you know inbox messages and emails and great things that i you know get because because i run my own business is how i'm inspiring other you know females mm. in the business to go out there and even you know, grow, they might not even be launching their own business, but to be brave enough to have mm. a voice in mm. the boardroom, to be brave enough to you know go for that promotion, to be brave enough to ask for more money, whatever mm. it might be, like that for me now is so important. And actually, you know, a big part of you know the the kind of new content that we're going to be putting out on this podcast is you're know, going to be around that kind of female leadership voice. So I think you're such you should be so proud of everything you've done just all the people that you're probably inspiring as well. It's interesting, you know, because I was having this discussion with someone the other day. I don't think there is enough, and I don't mean this necessarily um, aesthetically, but I don't think there is enough beautiful women putting themselves out there in an intelligent mm. way online. Mm. Like, so true. I don't want to get into like morality because I'm very traditional. So it's funny because I think a lot of people look at me in business and they go, fuck, she must be a bit of a ball buster. But actually in my personal life, I'm really submissive. I'm very like feminine. I'm very much the like traditional housewife type vibe. Like that's what I like. It's a real duality with my life. Yeah. But when I think about what women are taught, like rewarded with, if you like, to, to lack of a better word, online and in society right now, particularly in the West, it is be beautiful and shut up. Like take a picture on Instagram, mm -hmm. filter it and you look beautiful and you get rewarded with loads of likes. But there's no women who are beautiful with opinions saying, hey, you can be really feminine. You can be really like want that kind of traditional lifestyle, but also be really smart and go and do your own thing as yeah. well. And I think we need more women who are very feminine and and like love getting their nails done and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like I, I'm all about that life. Yeah. But who are also saying, hey, like I'm fucking smart and I'm running a multi-million pound business and you can do both. Like you don't need to be the one or the other. You don't need to be the OnlyFans girl. You don't need to be the chick who's posting thirst traps on <laughs> Instagram all the time. You can be that if you want, but then you can also be super smart and opinionated and, and have your own things. And I wish there was more women uh, not 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 because I feel like there's a lack of representation necessarily, but I think there's a lack of um, younger women, so, something to look up to that is not like just pretty. Yeah. You know, because at the minute what I see is like pretty or like ball buster. Yeah. And I, no one wants to be that. No. Like, that's like this aggressive, like quote unquote, like third wave feminist that no, I, like I definitely don't want to be. But I think there needs to be a conversation and, and more women who are that kind of like feminine energy going out there and actually you know you can be really smart and you can you can sit in a boardroom and be a fucking badass but yeah. also do all those other things that you want to do as well but also be feminine do you know what? i used to love that in my early part of my career i was taking you know jobs off guys that were 10 years older than me i was really you know i guess i didn't go to uni so i started younger yeah. um but i was always like you know the blonde girl in the room yeah. and i think ceos or you know the guys in my industry would think oh they're you know they're stupid young blonde yeah, girl yeah, yeah. in the car. Maybe, I mean, maybe that's what I, was my impression, but then no, I, I had actually, that impression too. I was all those own, there was like yeah. four girls in the business that I worked in the sales business um, and the rest were men and we always dominated them. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know if you can relate to this, but at the beginning of my career, I loved that ball buster role. Yeah, I was like, too. I can fucking be, run yeah. with the boys. Like, this is great. Cute. But actually what I've realized is like, well, I'm not the same as them. And I'm talking about that from a personal, not professional perspective professionally women and men can do exactly the same thing but personally like why am i trying to compete with you 
Yeah. Just stay in my own fucking lane. Yeah. And actually now I am focused on what I want to do and what I want to achieve and what how I want to live my life. It's not really surprising that I'm the most successful I've ever been. And it's only ever going to get better. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's having the bravery to do that. But I think yeah. also psychologically, as women, we approach things very differently. Like I know. Yeah. I know how to, you know, work. Manipulate. Yeah. People yeah. to get them where I need to get them. Whereas I think guys are quite... Um, self-obsessed no offense to all the men but actually to their to their defense they need to be right yeah like if you think about biologically men are i love how this is a marketing podcast like yeah. psychology but to <laughs> me they're the same they're the same, it's the same thing. thing it's the same um, thing uh, biologically we need to acknowledge that men are hunters and comp competitors so they have to have that tunnel vision right whereas women are nurturers we are designed to for lack of a better explanation raise and nurture children so of course we're more empathetic of course we're more emotionally intelligent which actually is what makes salespeople, women so good because you can read cues that men biologically can't yeah. read right they're not there exactly so yeah you i always i said sat down with two of the girls on the team um the other day and i said you need to learn to manipulate people. And they went, oh! and I was like, no, it's a good thing. I was yeah. like, you need to learn how to read what people want, mirror them, ask them questions, learn about what they want, and then get them to come to the conclusion that you've already had without making them think it was your idea. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God, that's so smart. And I was like, no, it's not smart. Just use what you've got. You've already got that yeah. pre-built. Use yeah. it. <laughs> we can, we can, and, and especially because we are in a, let's just be honest, it, unfortunately we are still in a place where it, the business world is more male dominated than it is female. That us women need, but need I think to use that more power. Of a, I think it's more of a limiting belief that women have than men holding us back. Like, no, 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 I'm with you on that, but I'm just saying there's more men in the workplace yeah. than there are females. There are, sure. And that's like, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. But I, I, my, the message I really want young women listening to this is to kind of take away if you are a young woman listening to this is you are not being held back no there is there is no, no, no bunch no. of bl blokes in a boardroom going we can't let women get ahead they are too worried about their own fucking mortgages yeah. to give a shit yeah. about whether or not you're <laughs> on the boardroom right but i think the limitations that women have often and i'm obviously expressly talking about in the western world because i'm not going to comment on any other world that i don't live in that is not unique to me the limitations that women put are on themselves. Yes. We, so we go, well, that. we can't get that promotion. Did you fucking ask for it? Confidence. Did you ask it, yeah. for the pay rise? Did you try and go and get venture capitalist investment? Or have you just assumed that you won't? Mm. That's your limiting belief. That's not the bloke who's sitting behind the desk's belief. That's your belief. So we need to get out of this mindset of like, we are less than. Like, so let's stop doing this whole work. We can be a girl boss. Like, let's all band together. Fuck that. You need to be in charge of your own career, your own life, your own financial goals and everything and go and ask for those things because that is why the guy in your office is head, more ahead than you and you're on the same fucking wave because he's gone and asked for it. Yeah. Did you ask for it? No. Just yeah. go and ask for it. That, honestly, I've done so many interviews on in, for International Women's Day about exactly this and that is the yeah. main thing that comes up it's yeah. our own limiting beliefs mm -hmm. and it's just because men are more have been or traditionally they're have been more rosy, and they yeah. and they and they go and ask for it we don't. and also they I think there was some study done that said that um with two job applications if a woman doesn't meet 80 percent of the job requirements she won't apply for it if a guy yes. meets 20 yeah. percent of the job requirements he'll apply for yeah. it that just summar that just summarizes the biggest issue between this whole quote-unquote gender equality thing is that men are willing to ask for things that women aren't yeah. So instead of being people pleasing and worrying about how people are going to perceive you, how about you just think about what you want and you be fucking selfish, fuck everyone else, and you go and get what you want. I'm so into that. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> um, right. Last question. And it's something that I'm asking all of my guests at the moment. Who would you like me to interview on the podcast? If you, or who do you want to hear from? Is there anyone in the industry that you really respect or that you've had yes. that you've interviewed that you think I'd find really interesting? So we actually have a client. I don't know if I'm allowed to say she's a client but we'll figure it out, um, called Charlotte. Okay. And she runs a business called The Fitting Room. And they are the PR agency behind like Burger and Lobster. Simmons, oh, nice. Um, Ex-client of mine, Burger and Lobster. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why they have to yeah. us. <laughs> but uh, she is amazing. Like not just as a human, she's a wonderful human. She's become a really good friend. Like we, this is like, this is why I love her so much. She messaged me the other day, like, and she was like, oh, do you wanna go for lunch? And I was like, yeah, she was like in Paris. And I was like the city. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, hey, <laughs> so we just fucked That's up good. Paris for the day and had lunch, but she's that kind of person. But more importantly, the reason why I suggested her for this podcast is because the way her brain works in terms of taking brands and applying them to pop culture and creating hype around those brands love that. is like, I've never seen it done before. She, she has such a finger on the pulse of like what the world wants 
to see and hear and feel from brands and then makes that come to life for those brands that I think she'd be a wonderful person for this podcast and would give a huge amount of value to anyone that's listening for sure Amazing. and also she's just really funny so yeah that's it good people that's that's what we want yeah Amelia thank you so much thank you I could talk to you forever so thank yeah thank you yeah likewise thank you Big so much thank you. thank you